Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me to share in this uh, Zoom conversation about the situation in Palestine and Israel, uh, which, as we all know, has become very uh, tense, problematic, uh, devastating, and tragic. Uh, and uh, it is at a moment when things could deteriorate even further, or maybe a solution might be found, though it's so difficult to see how that's going to happen. I've been interested in the situation there ever since I visited uh, Israel and Palestine in 1971 and, um, and have sort of followed the developments there and visited again uh, some years later uh, in 1990, uh, I forget exactly the date. Uh, I've also been involved with Palestinian Christians, especially some of those who have come to South Africa, and some of them have been uh, here at Falmouth, which incidentally is not in Cape Town, it's in Hermanus, uh, but it's in the Western Cape. And um, I, I know them personally. I know where they are. One is in Bethlehem and uh, several in other parts, uh, some in uh, in Jerusalem, in West Jerusalem. Uh, sorry, in East Jerusalem. So uh, I, I've had an interest in this uh, terrible situation and problematic one for a long time. But let me just say in terms of background, when I was a student uh, in America at one time in Chicago, was a leading person in the Christian-Jewish uh, post-Holocaust discussions. And so I was introduced to those discussions in America and attended several conferences at his request on the Palestinian-Israel issue, but mainly focusing on the Holocaust. So I know that story uh, quite well and have written about it uh, and thought often about it. And that certainly has influenced Christian theology, as you may know, quite apart from politics, ever since the end of the Second World War. Uh, I think what I'm trying to say is that my first coming at this problem was very much from the perspective of uh, the suffering of Jews in the Holocaust. So. Uh, it took a while before I could actually begin to grapple with the Palestinian situation. Uh, and that has led me to an identification with the Palestinian struggle, uh, which has been a long journey for me because of where I started. And I just want to say that as Christians, at any rate, it's very important that we do not in any way underplay the Holocaust and its significance, uh, nor that we today underplay uh, the feeling of threat that many Jewish people have and the, the phenomenon that we call anti-Semitism. I think those are all very powerful and important things to keep in mind. Uh, and I certainly have them in mind when I talk about the Palestinian situation now. And just so that you know up front, uh, my position is very clearly in support of the Palestinian struggle for freedom against what has become uh, an oppressive apartheid uh, control of the Palestinian territory. So that's where I'm coming from, both uh, having grown up in Holocaust studies and uh, also having experienced something of the Palestinian plight and knowing Palestinian Christians. So i just give you that background. I could say more about it. I've written about it as well. Uh, the second thing by way of introduction that I think is very important as we approach this is that obviously this is a highly charged political issue. Uh, and uh, as in every political situation, as you struggle to understand it, there are different narratives 
that are taking place. The narratives which inform the news broadcasting, which inform the decisions made by politicians, uh, and which, of course, are used in terms of both propaganda and in terms of trying to convince us of who is right and who is wrong. So all of those play into our discussion. It seems very important to me, as someone who was very involved in the Kairos document here in South Africa and still have strong connections with the Kairos document, and more recently with the Kairos Palestine document, which is based on the Kairos document, but written by Palestinian Christians. Uh, it's very important for me that I try and understand the situation uh, through the lens and in terms of the narrative and the story told by Palestinian Christians. And for me, that is encapsulated in the Pirate, the Kairos Palestine document, which if you hadn't, haven't read, I really do commend it as a very important statement of the Christian approach to the situation. Of course, that was written before the terrible events of recent days, but I believe that its fundamental position and message for us is, is critical as Christians. In talking to Palestinian Christians about this, uh, obviously, they feel as threatened as any other Palestinian, but they are in a very difficult position being Christian rather than Muslim. Uh, and so they have somehow to work out what is the distinct Christian Palestinian response to the situation in which they live. And I think as fellow Christians, part of our responsibility is to try and hear what they are saying and in many ways to be guided by what they are saying. At least that's where I would want to come from. So having said that, let me also say by way of introduction that when Dennis first approached me to deal with this, I said to him, well, what are the questions that people are asking? Uh, I don't want to talk uh, and try and provide some insight or even an answer to questions that nobody is interested in. So Desen very kindly sent me a letter with quite a lot of stuff in it, uh, which certainly uh, has got me thinking about how to speak uh, this evening. So I'm going to pick up on one or two of the points that Des mentioned, uh, maybe more than one or two, and then listen to other questions that people might have. And the first point that Des raised was the whole historical background in terms of uh, the state of Israel in the light of uh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And how do we as Christians understand that? Because one of the issues that we are faced with is that the situation there is not just a narrative of two opposing uh, groups, political groups, Israel and Palestine, but two groups whose historical identity has been shaped by a long, long history uh, that is already being uh, recorded in the Old Testament. And of course, there are different narratives in the Old Testament, uh, and invariably the dominant narrative that is picked up by uh, Zionist uh, uh, Jews and Zionist Christians is the promise of God to Israel to go in and possess the land, and even uh, to destroy the uh, people living there according to certain passages that uh, Netanyahu has quoted and a few others who are trying to uh, get us to believe that what they are doing is sanctioned by the Old Testament. So we, we have a, a problem here, a hermeneutic problem, that is a problem of interpreting the Old Testament. 
And there are a lot of Christians who find this exceedingly difficult because on the one hand, they can see where uh, Jewish people and people who identify with Israel and the Zionist cause, they can see some biblical justification for that position. On the other hand, they can also see that there's another narrative in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, which we refer to often as the prophetic tradition, uh, which calls into question any thought that Israel could act unjustly or oppress other people, because their experience has been of liberation from oppression in Egypt, and that has led them out of the out through the wilderness and out of that, and given them a different perspective of how to treat people who are also oppressed, who are aliens in their land, as they would describe it in the Old Testament. So there are these, at least two narratives that inform our reading of the Old Testament. So uh, Jewish Zionists and Christian Zionists can quote many texts from the Old Testament to support uh, their position. But they pass over some of the other texts from the prophetic tradition that calls into question Zionist nationalism uh, and keeps on reminding Israel that they are meant to be a light to the nations. And that means that they are called to live according to God's standard of justice and work for peace. Now, there are many Jews, some of whom I know here in South Africa, who are very critical of the state of Israel's uh, relationship to Palestine, very critical of the war in Gaza, and who do stand in that alternative Jewish Hebrew tradition of the prophets. They don't buy the narrative of the Zionists. In fact, they're very critical of it, and they're critical of it as Jews who also know the Bible. And this is a very important point, because too often those of us who criticize the state of Israel today are accused of anti-Semitism. Uh, but we are simply also repeating what many Jews are repeating. And it's a very strange thing to accuse a Jew of being anti-Semitic, uh, because they are questioning what the state of Israel is doing. So I don't think that it follows, as some people suggest, that to criticize the state of Israel is being anti-Semitic. It can be, and it sometimes has been, but that doesn't follow. And that's very important because I certainly, the background that I have already told you about, there's no way I want to be anti-Semitic or could be. But I'm very critical of the state of Israel and the way in which it is treating the Palestinians, uh, and particularly the way in which this war is being conducted. So let me also say that being critical of the state of Israel, and there are two points I want to make up front. The first is, doesn't mean to say that I am not critical of the Hamas attack on the Jewish settlers. Of course. Uh, I don't think anybody who's aware of what happened that day can say that that was justified. I think we can say it's understandable because it is the result of years of being oppressed by the state of Israel, which every now and again, as in the Intifada, bursts into acts of violence. And we can understand that because we know that from our own experience in South Africa. There comes a point in our history, when we could no longer stomach apartheid, and so there was an outburst that sometimes was violent, and understandably so, as in the armed struggle. So we understand all that, but that doesn't justify what happened on October the 7th. It helps us understand it, it helps us to get a perspective on it, but it doesn't justify it. Not in my book, uh, and I don't think 
uh, from a Christian perspective either. So that's the one thing to say. But the second thing, which is also very important, is that one can debate the fact as to whether the modern state of Israel is simply the successor to the biblical Israel, simply because it is a Jewish state. I think that's a debatable issue. In other words, I'm not persuaded that you can simply take promises to ancient Israel and apply them to modern Israel without raising some questions about the hermeneutics of that. The modern state of Israel is a creation that came out of the First World War, and it was really the creation of uh, the British authorities uh, trying to deal with the Jewish problem. Uh, and that was because Britain, uh, Palestine, as it was called, the whole of what is now Israel, Palestine, was Palestine territory, was largely under the control of Britain. It was a mandated territory, much like Namibia was uh, in terms of South Africa before nineteen before before the changes. And, and Britain was trying to solve a problem there because it continually uh, was bursting into acts of violence, uh, and uh, Britain had to somehow control that. And during that period, I might say, the Zionists uh, were regarded as terrorists uh, by the British. Uh, and some of the famous leaders later on in Israel were amongst the group uh, who were labeled as such. Now, uh, this isn't saying anything to justify any position. It's just saying that we need to understand the narratives that are happening here and that are being called into use in order to support positions uh, in a propagandist kind of way. And again, let me emphasize that this just doesn't justify anti-Semitism, nor does it justify acts of violence and terror against civilians, whether in Israel or in Palestine. So the first issue that Des actually raised was between ancient Israel and the promises given to Abraham and Abraham's descendants and modern Israel. Can we simply equate these two, as is being done by many uh, Israelis and especially by Zionists? And, of course, by Christian Zionists. Our Christian Zionists have a particular role to play in what is going on because they largely control the narrative in the United States uh, alongside the uh, Jewish uh, organizations uh, that exist to support Palestine in the United States. And they're very powerful, and they also are very strong in influencing uh, Christian uh, thinking and certain denominations in particular. Now, I understand the Christian Zionist position very well because as a young Christian, I was also involved in Christian Zionism. And my Bible, which was called the Schofield Bible, was all about justifying uh, Israel's claim to take over the whole of Israel. It was a dispensational approach to the Old Testament. I find that a very difficult position to defend but it is one that is very powerfully defended amongst many Christians, and not least here in South Africa, because dispensationalism has taken root in many uh, churches and denominations in South Africa that support the Zionist Christian cause and the Zionist Jewish cause at this point in time. But it's a very selective reading of the Bible, and it's one that is open to all kinds of critical questions. And as I say, I, I know the story well. I've had students who've researched it, and it's not one that holds up in my book to critical scrutiny. So let me move on then to the uh, one of the, the next things that 
des Reyes was about uh, what is the status then of Hamas? How are we to understand Hamas? Is Hamas the aggressor in this particular instance? And is Israel justified in its actions? And can one support the United States, the president of the United States, in more or less giving Israel a, a go-ahead to do whatever they have to do to defend themselves? These are critical questions that we face. Now, part of the problem goes back to, I think it was 1990, uh, I forget exactly when Hamas was elected as the governing, uh, as a government in, in Palestine. I forget, maybe somebody can remember. Uh, this was in the post the Oslo Accords, which proposed uh, the two state solution uh, to resolve the problem. And the two state solution was that Palestine. Uh, going back to its borders in 1967 would be a state, a self-governing state, separate from Israel, uh, and it would have all the rights of a state. Of course, the fine print hadn't been worked out, and the details of that hadn't been worked out, and that's never been implemented, because what we have had is a Palestinian authority uh, governing much of what was what we now call the West Bank uh, and West Jerusalem, and uh, Gaza being governed by Hamas, which is a political party that opposed the Palestinian Authority uh, in the elections that were held after the Oslo Accords. Now, the problem was that in Gaza, Hamas won the election, whereas in the rest of Palestine, it was the Palestinian Authority. And Hamas and the PA don't really agree on how to deal with the situation. And Hamas, uh, about the election of Hamas in Gaza in a democratic election. Immediately after Hamas was elected, neither the United States nor Israel and then several other countries refused to accept Hamas as the democratically elected government. It would have been like in South Africa if after 1996, when the ANC won the election, uh, countries around the world, like the United States or Britain, said, well, you've had a democratic election, it was free and fair, but we're not going to recognize the new government. And that's what happened in the case of, Ham of Hamas uh, in, in Gaza. So from word go, Hamas has been declared a terrorist organization. And the problem, of course, is when you call uh, a political party a terrorist organization, you undercut its authority, you spin a new narrative, uh, and you actually deny the democratic process, which you said you were going to upheld, uphold because you support democracy, uh, no, notably, of course, the United States. And again and again, Israel claims to be a democratic society, yet it refused to accept Hamas as a democratic uh, authority in, in Gaza. So this has been a problem right from word go in Gaza. Now, one of the psychological realities is that 
I have learned as a, as a professor, if you call it a student stupid, that student will begin to feel stupid and act stupidly. If you start treating somebody as a terrorist, you can be them no other option but to act according to what you've called them you're going to have to deal with that so is Hamas the aggressor well in terms of October the 7th yes is Hamas the aggressor in terms of the history of of Palestine and especially Gaza no it is reacting to oppression uh, and it is reacting quite clearly, violently, to oppression. So uh, you can't simply say Hamas is the aggressor when it is reacting to violence that is being done against uh, Gaza and the Palestinian territories. Uh, that, that's just taking it totally out of its historical context. Uh, Another question which Des posed was, it seems that neither Israel nor Hamas actually want a two-state solution. I think that's correct uh, to a large degree. If Israel wanted a two-state solution, there have been 20 to 30 years in which that could have been worked out. But successive governments in Israel have really not taken that solution seriously. And although the West has kept on saying the two-state solution is the only solution, the pressure on Israel to actually implement it has not been significant enough to bring it about. Now, does the Palestinian Authority want the two-state solution? Well, that's what they say, but they also say that it's becoming very problematic because so much of the Palestinian territory has now been taken over by settler communities, illegally according to the United Nations. And Palestine really suffers a great deal under a, a very oppressive Israeli military presence and security presence right there in the midst. So it's not as though uh, Palestine has been given really anything like the ability and the freedom uh, to become a meaningful state. Its land has been whittled away. Its control of security uh, is, is not in its own hands and so forth. In Gaza, the situation has been different. It's a small territory. Uh, it has very little outlet. Uh, and even what it's got, most of that is controlled by Israel, uh, except to the south, which is controlled by Egypt. So Gaza from day one uh, has found it impossible to actually become a democratic independent state, because neither Israel, nor the West, nor many other powerful countries have allowed it to become that. So it's a very complicated situation, but certainly is not as straightforward as the propagandists suggest. Uh, I think maybe the last point that I would want to pick up on is what we are seeing then a religious war, a war between Arabic Islamic forces on the one hand and Zionist Jewish forces on the other hand. I think that's too simplistic. And I don't think that Christians should be drawn into defining the struggle in those terms. And I'll say more about that, but let me pause there because there might be some questions that people have.